Welcome to the TV Writer Podcast, partner of Script Magazine, hosted by Gray Jones. You can follow me on Twitter, at Gray Jones is my handle. You can find all of these podcasts online at youtube.com slash Graham A. Jones, at scriptmag.com, or on the podcast website at tvwriterpodcast.com, where you can also find lots of other resources like the TV Writer Twitter database, with Twitter handles for over a thousand writers, and links to hundreds of free TV scripts. Now, on to the episode. My name's Gray Jones, and I want to welcome you to the TV Writer Podcast, partner of Script Magazine, episode 90 for May 2016. Well, today I'm so excited to bring you an interview with Ken Lezebnik, who is the founder and director of the Master of Fine Arts in TV and Screenwriting program at Stevens College. It's a low residency program based in Hollywood, and it is dedicated to raising the profile of women writers. It's a program that helps women to break into TV and feature writing. Very, very exciting program, and he's going to tell you all about it. And actually, in our next episode, episode 91, we're going to hear from one of the people who is taking the program, and, and that is Kanisha Foster. So uh, really exciting pair of episodes here talking about the, the exciting new program at Stevens College. Enjoy. Uh, so I want to welcome Ken Lezebnik to the podcast. Ken is the founder and director of the Master of Fine Arts in TV and Screenwriting program at Stevens College, a low residency program based in Hollywood, and that just launched in 2015. And uh, he writes for television, film, and the theater. His work includes collaborating with Garrison Kaler on Robert Altman's last film, A Prairie Home Companion, and many years of writing and producing hour-long television dramas, including seven years of writing and producing the very famous Touched by an Angel. And two of his plays have won citations from the American Theater Critics Association. His first book, Hollywood Digs, An Archaeology of Shadows, was published in 2014. And this is a collection of essays about personal encounters with Hollywood history, which sounds really cool. Uh, I get the impression that you have a lot of stories to tell. <laughs> well, I hope so. I, uh, it is a bit of a family craft. My father was a writer and taught writing at Stevens College which explains my lifelong affiliation with this school. Um, there are four Lezebnik children, uh, three brothers, my older brother Philip, who's written big animated features like Mulan and Prince of Egypt and uh, one of the co-writers of Pocahontas. And then my younger brother Rob, who's a longtime comedy writer, the last 10 years has been writing for The Simpsons. Uh, and my sister Cindy, who uh, is a, writes uh, nonfiction. Um, so it's, it's sort of, I guess, a, just the shoemakers, you know, children all have ended up being cobblers. <laughs> wow, wow, that sounds actually really fascinating. Um, so, why don't you tell me a little bit about about uh, when you grew up and, and when did you know? I mean, you, your father was a teacher at Stevens College for forty years. You told me, um, so you you grew up kind of in this environment. When did you you know for yourself that you wanted to to be a writer? I think that as I was growing up, one of the things I realized is when I felt some sort of emotional distress, one of the ways that was therapeutic for me was to write, to write about it, to sort of write it out. And I realized that from a fairly early age on. Um, I went to college in Minnesota at McAllister College and was always, was always writing. I was also an actor um, in <laughs> decades ago in the early part of my life. Um, but immediately out of college, uh, my, brother, my older brother Philip and I started a theater in Chicago. Uh, it was largely to put on Philip's musicals, uh, but I wrote one of them. And then um, within two years, I'd gotten a job offer from the Mixed Blood Theater in Minneapolis, run by my friend Jack Ruler, who, as he says, it's the only job he's ever had. He's run it for 40 years. Wow. Uh, and uh, it has been my sort of home-based theater uh, f for my entire career. They've produced I don't know, 10 of my plays. Um, so I, from a very early age on, I sort of realized that writing was what I did best. You know, it's that great adage, go where you were wanted. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly, when my wife and I moved to New York, and I wasn't getting acting jobs, but I was getting opportunities to write, it finally dawned on me, well, maybe this is really what I should just do. Yeah. And so I've, it's, it's been a wonderful uh, career telling stories. Mm. And, and so at what point did that become television? I, yes, I, it became television actually fairly late in my 
life in terms of people starting careers in television. Uh, as I said, I'd worked in Mixed Blood in Minneapolis. My wife and I moved to New York in the mid 80s. We started an off-off Broadway theater company, which was great and crazy. And our, our signature piece was the staging of the James Joyce story, stories, Dubliners. Um, in New York, I was able to connect with Garrison Keillor and write for his uh, public radio show, Prairie Home Companion. So we, we were living in New York and we were living in, our oldest son was born there uh, in a, and we were living in a one room apartment, four flight walk up on Christopher Street. And, and my brothers were out in Los Angeles and we'd go visit them and they had houses. <laughs> and they would say, you know, you should come out here, you should come out here. So I, in 1991, when her son was one, I think the final straw for Kate was she was walking our infant son Jack down Christopher Street in his stroller and somebody flicked a cigarette stub into his stroller oh <laughs> and, my. and Kate just said okay that's that's it I think it's time to, to go elsewhere um, so we moved out to Los Angeles and um, and it, it took a, about a year but then I got my first my very first staff job on a short-lived I, I was I wrote for a several short-lived shows when we first got out here. This happened to be a show called Jack's Place, mm -hmm. but remained friends with all of the people who were on that staff um, for the last over 25 years now. It's been, it's been a while. So that, that's what, how I got into the world of, of television. I should note that um, I learned the craft in a way, uh, I sort of <laughs> off the streets. Uh, I, this, this, this will date myself in terms of how old I am, mm -hmm. but at that point there was no um, DVRs, there was no you know, streaming. There was, what you could do was watch television live. Yeah. And so to learn how to write a one hour drama, I would, I would turn on the TV and I'd watch Cagney and Lacey. And I'd sit there with a notebook and I'd say, okay, so here's this opening thing and then there's a commercial. And now there's, oh, here's this scene, and then here's this scene, and here's this scene, and well, now there's a commercial. And so I figured out after a while, oh, I get it. There's like this thing called a teaser, yeah. and then there are these acts, and the, these scenes, oh, like there's a big story, and then there's a smaller story, and then there's like a C story. I didn't even know the vocabulary. But, uh, but eventually, it, in a way, it was a great way to learn because you feel like you really learned it uh, internally. There's yeah. something about internal, like, as opposed to just being told, here's how it's structured. I had to actually figure it out for mm. myself. Uh, which well, I actually think is a great advantage. That's, that's fantastic. It, it reminds me a little bit of uh, Blake Snyder who wrote Save the Cat. And, and I had read probably 30 screenwriting books before reading Save the Cat. And it was his book that finally opened my eyes to, to the structure. And now, of course, everybody's trashing Save the Cat now because all the Hollywood movies are, are following that structure too rigidly. But yeah. um, one of the things that he did, he it was back in those days, and he would record on a tape recorder so that he could listen to the shows in his car and analyze the structure in the same way mm -hmm. and i and i think that when you do it that way you you can grasp the structure in a, in a very different way that yeah. you sort of get a feel for it yeah and of course the um the essential element of learning to write in any craft, but especially for television, is just to simply do it. Mm. And that's why in the MFA program, I think we have a, a lot of emphasis on, you know, the first year you're writing a screenplay, but you're also writing the spec one hour, and then you're writing your own, um, you know, your own pilot. And in year two, then students continue writing another screenplay, and then their thesis project, which could be, you know, their own original hour-long pilot. It could be a comedy show. It could be a web series. Uh, but I think there is something to writers write, and the best way to learn writing is to do a lot of writing. And uh, the thing that I do believe helps immensely is to have mentors who then can give you the right kind of feedback. Because mm. many people can write script after script after script, but if they don't get, I think, the right sort of inspiration, people asking them the right questions, they, they plateau. Mm. And, and certainly our goal is to produce um, graduates who work. Mm. That's the whole point. Yeah. Well, t tell me about some of your mentors when you were early on learning the, the, the craft of, of writing. You said you got on a, on a few uh, sort of short-lived shows. I, I noticed that you wrote on The Commish with uh, Stephen Cannell, who I'm a big fan of his. Uh, 
Um, well, I, I, yes, that's a great question. And I, yeah. I, sh I want to go back to, I always acknowledge Garrison Keillor, because especially for writers, mm -hmm. you know, Garrison is the most prolific human being I've ever met. I always want to acknowledge that he, he didn't need any other writers. So mm -hmm. he was, this was just a gift. I, he has a two hour show. And at the point where I was writing for the show, I would write the five minutes of it that he didn't. And the thing I learned from Garrison, it, it, was, it was a different medium, radio. Mm. Um, but the thing I learned from Garrison was this feeling that it, is, that it is material. And when I say that, what I mean is coming from the theater, I, I had a certain possessiveness and preciousness about my writing that you'd labor for a long time writing the play and it, it became something you sort of held on to. And I remember the first time I was at, uh, <clears throat> with Garrison as he was putting together, because you know, it's a weekly show. Mm. And so Friday night, <clears throat> we'd had a group of scripts and do a read through with the actors. And then Friday night, go back to his office. And you know, he just sort of sit there and go, well, um, I like this line. And then he would, overnight, he, he would take this one line from a seven page script and just totally rewrite it. You know, just throw everything out. And, and it was nothing to him. He would just like throw things out, um, repurpose things, you know, rearrange things. And I suddenly thought, oh, this is material. It's like somebody making a suit. You just sort of use the things that work and you patch it together and you, you know, you're creative, of course, but it was, it was letting go. It was his amazing ability to let go. So I, I want to acknowledge Garrison. When I first came out here, this wonderful, brilliant writer named Norman Steinberg, um, who was a Mel Brooks writer. He was one of the writers mm -hmm. on Blazing Saddles. And he wrote this, one of my favorite movies, my favorite year. Um, and then he was a TV comedy writer. Um, and Norman, this was the most amazingly generous thing. He just read one of my scripts and liked it and invited me to lunch. And then he invited me to co-write with him this adaptation of a book uh, as a project for Michael Keaton. And unfortunately, it never got off the ground, but it was, to me, the most amazing learning experience because I'd go with Norman and we'd have these meetings with Harry Columbi, who was Michael Keaton's manager. And, and, and Harry and Norman, this was, this was when I felt like, oh, this is how Hollywood should be or how it was, I think. Because our meetings, <laughs> I mean, there would be like an hour of Norman and Harry just schmoozing and telling jokes and reminiscing about, you know, these, because, you know, Peter O'Toole or whoever it was that, and, and, and Harry Columbia had been Thelonious Monk's manager. So you get Thelonious Monk stories. And I'm just sitting there going, are we, at some point, I guess we're going to work, but it's like, this is like an hour and a half of them just like talking. And wow. <clears throat> it was, I think that was like my little touch with that sort of feeling of old Hollywood, mm. where it was this luxurious camaraderie. Um, anyway, so I just want to acknowledge Norman, who was, you know, fantastic. And, and, you know, the very first, I will also say the very first show that I was on staff for, that show Jack's Place, run by this great guy, Scott Shepard who um, was a brilliant showrunner and in my very first job was able to show me, all right, this is how an hour long drama can be run, mm. you know, and, and done really well. So I, I'm very grateful to all of these people who've been incredible mentors. Mm. And, and fairly early on, you got on Touched by an Angel. Mm -hmm. And that was seven years that you were on that show. Yeah, yeah. Tell, tell me about um, what you what you learned in your craft from being on a long running show like that. Well, if, first of all, speaking of mentors, Martha Williamson, who was the showrunner, um, and maybe it's not totally unrelated that I worked, you know, for a woman showrunner, and now I'm, you know, this part of this program that's that's uh, about getting women writing for TV and, and film. Uh, you know, Martha's a brilliant storyteller. She has an incredible imagination for story. Uh, we had this really wonderful, fortunate experience of it being an anthology show. Every week, you know, the angels, the thing, nice thing about writing for angels <laughs> is that their characters don't change. You know, they don't experience arcs. They are who they are. Um, and we had a chance to, I looked at it sometimes as you could write this great little one act play every week. And it could be about different things. You know, Martha wrote a, she got involved with the issue of the, of, of, um, the hardship of, in, in Sudan during the famine. So she wrote about that. And we'd write about human stories, about issues in America, just about human stories based on our own life experiences. I got the, the chance to write what I thought was sort of this homage to an O'Neill 
one act set in the bars, like a bottle show all set in the bar. Um, it was a very unusual experience, and it, um, it also it showed me a couple of things. One was the in infinite quantity of stories in the universe. Um, you know, there's this great Muriel Ruckhauser quote that the universe is not made of atoms, it is made of stories. And when you work on a show like Touched by an Angel, you realize, you know, you do it for the whole show ran eight years, I was around for seven of those years, that, that you go through hundreds and hundreds of stories in the writer's room. And there are just an infinite amount of stories. Uh, having said that, of course, there's actually only about seven stories, but there are an infinite amount of human beings. And it is through the human beings' individual perspectives that it makes the story unique. Um, so it was, it, was a wonderful, it was a wonderful experience as a writer. I think it was a very luxurious experience as a writer because you got a chance to just do whatever stories you wanted. We would do period pieces, we do socials, you know, social issues, we do fun stories, we do romantic stories. It was, it was a great experience because it, it sort of crossed a lot of genres, really. Mm. Now, speaking about crossing genres, a lot of the work that you've done since then has been in, in different genres. You, you've done from Star Trek Enterprise to um, the, the feature film, Prairie Home Companion, to Army Wives, um, and then uh, in performance at the White House, and, and a bunch of different things, plus you've produced plays. Um, so tell me about sort of the, how you branched out after that point. Well, one thing that I'm a big believer in is that, strangely enough, the essential question for a writer as she or he enters her writing career is, who are you? To know thyself. Hollywood, oftentimes people pr uh, approach it with the notion that I have to figure out what is commercial. And I'm a believer that if you know yourself and you know who, who I am, who is my identity, that is the most uh, profitable in the sense of artistically profitable and also economically profitable way to approach your career. Uh, I mention this in part because um, I came to realize, I came out here, and I, and I have, I've written comedy and I've written serious things, um, and after a while, I suddenly realized, look, look at you. You grew up in Missouri. You're this Midwestern person. You wrote for Prairie Home Companion. You've written for Touched by an Angel. You're the Heartland guy, <laughs> whether I liked it or not. And, and there were times where I was uncomfortable with that because my work in the theater is often not that. But that's clearly part of my identity, whether I liked it or not. Um, my identity shifted about seven years ago when my our eldest son uh, went to West Point. Um, and all of a sudden, I was an army father. This was very unexpected. My wife's an actress. I'm a writer. You know, this, we don't come from military backgrounds. I mean, my father was in World War II, but you know, I, this wasn't part of my identity. And all of a sudden, I was an army dad. And I can distinctly remember going to West Point uh, during Jack's first year there and meeting one of his professors who had just come back from uh, leading a, a battalion in Afghanistan. And so I was expecting to see a guy from the Hurt Locker. And instead, here's this guy who's chipper, and he's upbeat, and he's funny, and he's brilliant. And it suddenly dawned on me that my own industry had put stereotypes in my head without me even realizing it. Mm -hmm. It made me realize the power that film and TV has. You don't even realize, you don't know the kind of deep stereotypes that are get embedded. And, and that was a real eye-opener for me. So, me. so for me personally, I started feeling the desire to try to tell stories that humanized and made more fully human soldiers and, and their families. Um, and that led to this wonderful chance to write a script for Army Wives and more recently a screenplay about a gold star mother in my hometown in Columbia, Missouri. Um, because I just felt compelled, that, be, that became part of who I am. Mm. And I com felt compelled to sort of tell those kind of stories. Yeah. And, uh, and you've produced, is it 11, 12 produced plays? Um, tell me about your playwriting. Is that continuing even now? Yeah, it is actually continuing. Um, I actually, this summer, I don't think Kanisha knows this, but this summer I'm workshopping a play that I started developing with a composer years and years ago. Um, in the same way that, the, that, that I just was talking about personal experience, for me anyway, informs my writing in the TV and film, um, 
I have a, a, a nephew and, and two other nephews who are on the autism spectrum. And um, so I got very engaged in exploring issues around the topic of autism. And three of my plays have, have been uh, investigations of, of people on the spectrum and what it means and how our society reacts to that. And, and my own perceptions and understanding, uh, I, I hope, have grown and morphed during the somewhat 10 years that I've written these, these three plays ab about that topic. Um, I've, the other plays have been a lot of things. I, I also have this uh, lo lifelong interest in baseball. I started a literary journal about baseball uh, back in Minneapolis 30 years ago. And I've written a couple of baseball plays, um, a one-man show about Calvin Griffith and a, a, a play about a, mythic, a, about a fictional Los Angeles Angels bullpen uh, during spring training which was called League of Nations, because it was, it was an exploration of that, uh, that baseball, in a strange way, is the most, because it's a meritocracy, brings together the most diverse workforce mm. in the world. You know, you get people from, you know, uh, Latin America, from Americans to African Americans to Chinese to Koreans. It's like, uh, I said, Japanese, not Chinese. Anyway, it's, it's, uh, th this one play sort of explored this, this issue of this League of Nations feeling in this, in this one setting. Um, so yeah, so my, my plays, um, and again, I, I, I'm not someone who says you can only write what you know. I don't believe that. But I do believe that for me, it's important. It's just what I, the place I come from. And especially for emerging writers, um, I've always felt that each writer should write his or her own David Copperfield. That one script that tells the world, this is who I am, this is where I've come from. And it allows the world to sort of say, oh, I get you, I, I see who you yeah. are. And, and I think it's an essential part of every writer's first steps as a writer. Very, very cool. I, before we get to talking about the MFA program, I do want to um, hear more about your book, um, Hollywood Digs and Archaeology of Shadows. Uh, tell me about, like, what are the stories that, that are in this book? The, the first essay, it's a collection of essays in which I have made personal encounters with a shard of Hollywood history, and it intrigued me, and I followed up on it. Um, the first essay I wrote for the book was an essay about F. Scott Fitzgerald, one of my literary heroes, in part because I lived in Minnesota for so many years. Um, and I discovered many years ago, because uh, I was reading letters from F. Scott Fitzgerald to his daughter Scotty, and I saw this address in an Encino. And for those of us who live in LA, you go, F. Scott Fitzgerald lived in Encino? <laughs> and then I dug further and realized that he was renting the cottage of character actor Edward Everett Horton, who played the fussy butlers in all those Astaire and Rogers movies. He was reduced to renting the cottage on the estate of Edward Everett Horton in Encino. And it was so wow. painful to me that this great novelist was, you know, on the, in the cottage of the butler's estate that I wrote an essay about that experience. And then it led me to other interesting little intersections of Hollywood history. Um, I'm friends with the daughter of Jock Mahoney, the 13th Tarzan, who led a tragic, um, fascinating and tragic life. He came out here, he was a stuntman originally. He started, and, and an amazing stuntman. He was apparently one of the few men who could stand flat-footed behind a horse and leap onto the horse's back. Wow. Um, and then he had, he started acting. His first acting jobs were in comedy westerns with the Three Stooges. And then he had his own TV show uh, in the 50s, Range Rider. And then he was cast as Tarzan. And in his second Tarzan film, and by the way, along the way, he um, married Mrs. Fields, who had a daughter, Sally, and then wow. was the father of my friend, Princess O'Mahony, who's a wonderful, and, and has worked in Hollywood for many years as a great AD. Um, that, but anyway, so he was cast as Tarzan. In his second Tarzan film, they were filming in Thailand. And because he was a stunt guy, he always did his own stunts. And they asked him to leap off a moving cargo plane into a reservoir of water. And being a stunt guy, he did it. Nobody apparently realized this reservoir of water was contaminated with human fecal matter. 
Sorry, I hope no one is just eating lunch or eating while they're watching this podcast. Um, and he, as a side effect, <clears throat> because apparently there are a lot of mosquitoes around, he contracted dengue fever. And during the filming, lost like 40 pounds. And because, as Princess, his own daughter admits, he was never much of an actor, but he was a body. You know, he was this incredibly handsome, six foot four strapping guy. It kind of effectively ruined his career. And so then he spiraled downward and you know, moved from the house in Encino to the house in Van Nuys to the house in Reseda and um, ended up playing one of Catwoman's henchmen on the old Batman TV show. Mm. And so uh, that was one of the stories. Wow. I also I had a wonderful chapter, which I'm very pl proud of or happy with because they've remained very strong friends with Gidget. Many people don't realize that Gidget is a real person and that she's uh, great, she's, a, she's healthy, she's alive, and she's Jewish. And that her father, who wrote the novel Gidget, was an intellectual emigre from Eastern Europe who fled Nazi Germany um, and then you know, ended up being a screenwriter in Hollywood. Um, and I just thought that was such a fascinating side to this story that a lot of people aren't aware of. Um, and Kathy, Kathy Zuckerman, who is Gidget, uh, is one of the fantastic person and still uh, has this vital you know, energy and uh, is, a, is a, become a great friend. So anyway, that's a, a few of the stories from this book. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking. Yeah, very cool. Well, so now we'll, we'll get on to your, your teaching in the MFA program. So in 2010, you became an adjunct professor at Pepperdine University. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and more recently than that, um, you launched this MFA program dedicated to um, getting more women in the industry, raising their profile. Uh, I know when I first launched this pod, uh, podcast in 2010, one of the first sort of special series that I did was in 2011, I think, a series on women in TV. And at the time, and this is five years ago now, um, the stats that I was looking at were pretty shocking in terms of um, just how underrepresented women are in TV staffs. There's a lot of TV staffs that have sort of the one token woman. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of TV staffs don't have a single woman on them. Um, and so tell me in, in, in your words, like what made this need so strong for you that you wanted to create this program? Well, I, part of it was, as I mentioned earlier, I grew up around Stevens College, an all women's college in Columbia, Missouri. Um, I had a lifelong affiliation with it. I helped them get a film program started as a, as a film major at the college about 10 years ago. And I, as you had noted from your research, I was sort of very aware of this uh, under, you know, this horrendous underrepresentation, and I discovered I enjoyed teaching. I also teach screenwriting for the USC Stark Producing MFA, and, and I suddenly thought, you know, there's a real need here, and Stevens is perfectly positioned to, to do something about this. And uh, the nice thing about Stevens, it's a small enough institution that I was in Columbia, Missouri visiting, had dinner with Diane Lynch, the president of the school, and I said, you know, I think Stevens could do a low residency MFA in TV and screenwriting. And she just said, great, let's do it. And so, so we did. Um, she, I give full credit to Diane, because in my head, my initial impulse was I thought, yeah, I could, I could go back to Missouri for 10 days at a time and do the workshops. And she said, are you crazy? Do it as a satellite campus in LA, because that's where all the talent is. And, and the moment she said that, everything sort of opened up for me because our, fa our faculty is all working writers. They did great pride. We're all members of the Writers Guild. And all of, um, I have such terrific support from women writers who understand the difficulties and the challenges and really want to help. And um, so we've had this fantastic group of guest speakers who are both inspiring and informational and um, are able to really give a great perspective to the students. Um, it's, it's just something that I think is vitally important in, in part because I really do believe that a, a culture is known by the stories it tells. And that when you don't tell the stories of half of the culture, 
you are, you're missing, um, there is this void and it's not a healthy void. And so um, I just think as a culture, we will be so much healthier uh, when we uh, are able to tell the stories of everyone in our culture. You know, it's funny because I think when I was a kid, there was this notion that the, the media, the television, was this great unifier in, in America. Mm. Um, and of course, it sort of was, but it was this very narrow prism. You know, it told these very <laughs> you know, blatantly false stories about American life. You know, if you, you look at early television shows, um, uh, and, and then as, as, the, as the medium matured, and certainly with the explosion of the internet and content sort of all over the place, the dream is that, oh, well, now there's a million outlets for storytelling uh, online and, and 400 TV shows on the air. Um, this will be great because it opens up this massive spectrum of storytelling. And it, it hasn't felt like it's really done that. It felt, feels like people instead are, are gathering little silos to reinforce their preconceptions. Um, so at any rate, I just, I just think it's vitally important to get um, more voices into the mainstream. I, 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 think, I like to think that our program works on two levels professionally, mm -hmm. to absolutely try to get women writing for the traditional mainstream television, cable, and then also to be looking to the future and to build new ways that, that you know, women's stories can be told online, whether it's you know, YouTube or um, your own, you know, your own produ mini productions that you just put online. Um, I'm just a big believer that we have to be looking you know, to the future uh, and teaching to the future, as well as, as letting people gain absolute expertise in the craft that will get them employment right now in mainstream media. Mm. Yeah, and, and so how do you see um, the strength of the mentors? Because um, I, I know that, uh, that there's a lot of people who, who will go through a, an MFA program, the standard MFA program, they'll just come on out of the program and maybe they're too scared to break in or they, they haven't got the personal motivation. Um, I know that mentorships, even uh, my wife and I are taking a real estate course right now, and there's mentors in this real estate course, and they kick our butts. <laughs> and they, they motivate in a way that a, a standard sort of teacher-student relationship mm -hmm. doesn't. Can you talk about that, about, um, about how you've seen the power of these mentors and why you mm -hmm. wanted to set it up that way? Yeah, it's very, the mentor relationship is really important to me. I think it's the difference between the sort of the sage on the stage model of here's somebody just standing in front of the classroom sort of telling people here is how one should do this and this very one-on-one -on -one relationship um, which is different and I, I think the way it is playing out is in a couple of different ways. Um, on one level some of my mentors I try to make very specifically um, tailored to the individual student. For instance, we have one student who this year worked on a, she's a, a, an army veteran. We actually have three female military vets in the program. She's an army veteran. She was telling a story that was very personal, but very totally in the world of the army. And I said, you know what, I should really find somebody who knows that world, who's you know, of that world. So I've, I've TJ Brady, who went to West Point and served in the army, uh, and now is a great writer out here in LA. He was able to come on board for that one woman's, as a one woman's mentor. And that's that sort of very particular and specific knowledge that I think he brought that is able to let her script, you know, realize itself most fully. I also like to think that as we move through the program, you know, students will engage with at least five different mentors during the two years, if not six, that among those relationships, I am confident there will be at least one person that becomes a, a long-term, you know, mentor relationship. Because I know that's how it, you know, how it works in the business, is mm. you find somebody who says, oh, I like you, I, I like the way you write. Um, you know what, here's a show that I'm running and I think that I, we have this opening for whatever, a writer's assistant or a staff writer, and you know, let's bring you in and talk about this job. Um, 
I'm very confident that by the one-on-one -on -one nature of these relationships, um, that network will develop for our students. Uh, it's partly why I'm very committed to bringing in all these working writers and showrunners, um, both as mentors and just as one-off speakers to the program, because I think that people will connect. <clears throat> there will be these points of connection to um, individuals that will you know, lead to employment. Mm. Well, and we we're, we we're talking off camera about how when you do have the workshops, the 10-day workshops, how everybody lives together. They, <laughs> they stay in the hotel and... Not and, in the same room. Not in the same room, <laughs> but they, they stay in the same hotel and there's a, a sort of... Right. A, it's, a, it's a very focused experience <laughs> when you take the work. Yes, and, and that's very, really, I think it's really important to me, uh, to the program, to have that kind of cohesiveness um, by all staying in the same hotel. I mean, everyone has their own room. Um, but it's what I, because I'm very aware that, okay, here's this low residency model. Unlike a residential campus, you know, where people you know, see each other daily over two years, it's a very intense, you know, coming together for 10 days in August, and coming together again for 10 days in January. But what has been incredibly wonderful for me to see is that the bonding that happens in those 10 days extends all the way through the year. And there's this, and, and this is where, you know, Facebook and, and Twitter and all that stuff actually is enormously helpful because our students stay very connected. Kind of an ongoing communication stream between all the students during the course of the year. And that's great because one thing I really want to do is I want to build a community. I'm really big in this idea that the, the thing that will make this whole program work, and it is working already, is to build a community so that we have our first cohort. Here's 20 students. Now we're bringing in in August our second cohort. Here's 20 more students. When the first cohort graduates, to me, it's not like they go off and disappear. All right, great. Now you are part of this community, and this we keep building on this community. We, you know, part of after graduation, the idea is that um, each student will specifically have one mentor that specifically is tasked with, all right, every three months you go out to lunch with this person or talk to them on the phone or make sure they're on track, you know, see what their issues are, see what their problems are. Um, I think in my dream scenario, we will build up this community over years that will be you know, incredibly strong working writers who will help each other. It's really a goal of mine. Very cool. And, and so um, since everybody is coming and staying in a hotel, um, uh, it's not necessarily only people in Los Angeles. Pe people could oh, be oh, anywhere yeah. in North America and take this low residency. Oh, program. absolutely. Yes, oh, absolutely. Yeah, we actually the first year one, I think we have seven Los Angeles residents. I think that's right. Out of the 20. Year two, we only have maybe three LA residents. They, mm -hmm. um, I was very happy the first year we have students from Missouri, Kansas, New Mexico, Washington State, uh, Colorado, um, California, Illinois. And then my goal was, I said, wow, we really aren't east of the Mississippi much. So this coming year, we have people from Florida, uh, New York State, um, Michigan, you know, and we're really spreading out over the map this, this coming year. This, and this is the beauty of a low residency program, is if you are somebody who is a work, has a career, you're mid-career, you have children, most of our students are people with kids, with careers, but they can get away for 10 days. And it's not even mm. 10 days. We're, we bracket the 10 days by two weekends. So if you can miss a week of work, you can twice a year, you can do this program and get your MFA no matter where you are. Or what you know, We have one, one woman whose husband's in the Air Force. She's going to be coming in from Italy. You know, they're going to move wow. to Italy next year. So um, you, anywhere in the world, you know, theoretically, if you can get to L.A. for these two workshops, you can achieve this MFA. Which that is, is fantastic because I know a lot of people, particularly who watch the, the podcast, are, are in a situation where they might have done their undergraduate degrees and then gotten work and gotten a family and gotten busy right. and and the idea of coming back to a full residency program it, it just is logistically impossible right so right. That, I mean this sounds like a fantastic option for for people now um, currently you the first year and second year you only had 20 students do you, do you see this growing do you see a larger number I, in I actually years? I like the number 20 I, I because to me it's this is a um, an intimate boutique setting. I mean, I, I feel like this is part of what we have to offer. 
It's very individualized. It's very personal. Um, I know I was just talking to a, a friend of mine who's in, involved with the UCLA MFA in screenwriting program. They're kind of like growing it exponentially. And to me, well, I, nothing, <laughs> maybe, nothing, you know, look, UCLA has a great MFA. I don't really, I realize this is not being negative about them. I'm just saying for me, for this program, I think the way it's going to blossom and be incredibly enriching is if it's small, if it's, if it's intimate, so it's very one-on-one. -on -one, um, and we, this, is, this is, to me, this is where we're at. 20 students every year, and that, that it's like we will be small but mighty. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very, very cool. And, and so the 2016 session is full. Um, yes. So if this is something that people could consider for the 2017 session. Yes, um, absolutely. And how, do, how do people find out about the program? www.stevens, Stevens with a ph, stevens.edu, and we are uh, in there. We're on that website. Um, you're also welcome just to email me at K Lezebnik, the letter K Lez Yeah, good luck with spelling Lezebnik right. <laughs> Hopefully, you'll be <laughs> on your podcast somewhere at stevens.edu. Um, so, uh, but yes, if you and, and if you Google, you know, Stevens MFA in TV and screenwriting, we we pop up, mm -hmm. and how I wrote that. Oh yeah, and how I wrote that podcast. <laughs> yes, um, very 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 cool. So so as we start to wrap things up, um, outside of this this program, I mean, you've been in the industry for for quite a while, and not just one part of the industry. You've seen a lot of different facets of the industry. What would your tips be um, to somebody who is just starting out? and wanted to break into particularly television and writing, um, what would you tell them to do? It's, what's nice is now I feel vetted in my advice because I've had so many people, so many incredible people come through the program. So I've heard the commonalities. And the one thing that every writer says is, and it sounds just like common sense, but some people don't seem to realize this, is you writers write, keep writing. Um, one friend I heard had this great take of, um, if you are incredibly talented and work incredibly hard in this business, you have a one in a thousand shot of making it. And what that means is that if you take that shot and you don't succeed that time, you simply have 999 more times to try and you, you can't make it. Um, so I don't want to minimize how hard it is, but it is possible that um, the keys are to simply continue writing. I was at a conference at the veteran, the Writers Guild sponsors a veteran writing workshop that I mentor at. And one of the managers there said, I insist that my clients every six months, no matter how old they are, no matter how long they've been in the industry, give me some new piece of material. It's like every six months you should be writing, you should end up producing some script. You should have finished some, some new script. Um, it's, it's such a competitive business. And unfortunately, in the, there are a couple of super geniuses maybe that can afford to be lazy, but I don't, I personally don't know any lazy people. Mm -hmm. The most, you know, uh, successful people I know are incredibly hardworking. Um, my brother, Philip, who worked for Jeffrey Katzenberg at, at DreamWorks, Jeffrey's not a writer, but I thought this is the model of the sort of person that you will be competing with for a job. When Jeffrey was a PA, he was assigned to get um, book and a ticket to India for an executive, a studio executive. So he did so. And then when that executive was walking into his hotel in India, when it's two o'clock in the morning in Los Angeles, the phone in the hotel lobby was ringing. It was Jeffrey calling to make sure he had arrived safely. Wow. And you know, that's for better, or for worse, it's that kind of real commitment that, that people should know that that's that's the standard. So you have to be incredibly hardworking, but but uh, persistence in the end is is the other thing that um, tends to out. You know, it's like the people who drop by the wayside, oftentimes just fail to persist. Um, it's not an easy profession, but but it is immensely rewarding. You know, when you when you feel like you have you're on a set and you're watching something you've written being filmed. It's, it's, there's no feeling like it in the world. It's so much fun. Very cool. Well, that is a great place to end up. And uh, you've already mentioned your email address. And, and is there, are, are you on Twitter? I am on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I, and yes, please tweet me. I, I'm not, uh, we were, I'm laughing because earlier we were saying that 
uh, Kanisha Foster of how I wrote that, or at MFA screenwriter, is much more adept at Twitter than I am. Uh, but I, yes, I certainly would respond to any you know direct, direct tweet. What? I'm, look, I'm not even articulating the vocabulary correctly. Uh, I would respond to any tweets you send me. Let's put it that way. Very cool. And, and so your Twitter handle is? I think it's just Ken Lezepnik. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'll check that and I'll, I'll make sure to put it on the podcast. Post. All right. Okay. Well, Ken, thanks so much for being gener generous, with, not only with your time, but, but really spearheading this program. Um, I think that the, the impact of this program is going to be great over, over the years. And I can't wait to see it. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for, for your time. For, uh, it's been a delight to, to be here. Great. Thanks. All right. Thanks. I want to thank this week's sponsors. Black Magic Design, makers of DaVinci Resolve 12 edit software. And much more at blackmagicdesign.com. If you've got kids eight and under, they're going to love the fun animated songs at abc123songs.com. I want to remind you that you can follow me on Twitter, at Gray Jones is my handle for the latest updates. And as always, there are tons of resources at tvwriterpodcast.com. You can find all of these podcasts on YouTube at youtube.com slash Graham A. Jones. See you next time.